I am someone who is looking for love. Real love. Ridiculous, inconvenient, consuming. Can't live without each other love. Everyone is looking for love, yet not everyone can find it. Join me, Tara Richter, certified dating coach and published author on The Dating Jungle, Finding Love, a step-by-step -step guide to removing yourself from toxic situations and maintaining healthy relationships. Proud part of the Live and Love Radio on the Talk Wild Network. Welcome to the very first episode of The Dating Jungle, Finding Love. I'm your host, Tara Richter, certified dating coach and published author. Joining us for our debut show is a very good friend of mine who I've known since the beginning of my writing career, Colin Flood. Hello. How are you doing tonight? Good. Good. Glad to have you in the studios on the very first episode of The Dating Jungle. And I know it's exciting, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, this is great. <laughs> I know it's a lot of fun. So tonight our topic is we're going to discuss um, five books that every relationship needs. Um, and we're also going to discuss, well, actually more like seven. We'll see how many we can get through. Maybe um, two. Yeah, maybe two. <laughs> of course, we have to discuss the uh, very first two important books are the ones that I have published myself, which are 10 Rules to Survive the Dating Jungle and 10 Rules to Survive the Internet Dating Jungle. Now, I know, Colin, you have a copy of the first book because you came to my launch party in, uh, when was that? That was like October of last year. That's all? Yeah, it was, uh, what, that, I know, it wasn't that long ago, huh? Not even, like, barely a year ago was the launch party for the first book. So the little one is first? Yeah, so the little one is the first one. Okay. And that's the one I wrote um, as I was going through divorce and uh, healing my wounds and making roles for myself, venturing out into the dating jungle again and to make sure that I could remove myself from toxic situations into healthy ones. Well, I remember the Tarzan in particular because there was a Tarzan there. We did. We had a costume party and yeah. people dressed up as animals from the jungle. I was Jane. We had Tarzan. He had, um, and he, he showed up in just a loincloth. <laughs> yeah. And it was in October. Brave man. <laughs> It was brave. It was a lot of fun. You can actually see photos of it. I have photos and videos on my website, uh, datingjunglebook.com. But then the second one, which is 10 Rules to Survive the Internet Dating Jungle, which is all about going on uh, internet dating sites, review of sites, which ones are good, which ones aren't so good, which ones are free, you know, how to initiate contact. And that one, I had a launch party on Valentine's Day, but that one you weren't able to make it. Well, I mean, isn't that what everybody's doing these days? I mean, does anybody, like, I don't know what, meet people in grocery stores anymore? They do, actually. I met a guy on a cruise uh, a month and a half ago. And uh, it were actually... A singles cruise? No, it was oh. just a regular cruise. Oh, okay. No, we were just on a cruise. It was over St. Patty's Day. My girlfriend and I just went out for fun. And I uh, went to Cozumel and uh, Key West. And I met a guy from D.C. who I've been talking to ever since. And he's flying down on Friday to come and visit me. Wow. So wow. You can't So what's the next people. book going to be? Um, you know, I've been toying back and forth in my head. Um, I was thinking about how to find uh, the whole package. Because, you know, a lot of people, once they're out there dating, um, they can find people that, you know, may have two or three qualities that they like, but they're lacking on three or four qualities. And like when I got married, I kind of settled for my husband, um, hence why we're divorced, and because it wasn't the whole package. And, you know, I think sometimes when you're in relationships, you think that, oh, well, I can never find the whole package, or I can never find everything I want in one person, but you really can if you take the time and you wait um, for that person to come into your life. The eternal optimist. I am. <laughs> so you, 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 are, you think that it's possible to find Mr. Right. Well, no, and see, I don't believe in Mr. Right. I believe in Mr. Perfect for me. Because there is not just a Mr. Right or a Mrs. Right. It's, you know, whoever is most compatible with you isn't necessarily most compatible with me. You know, well, obviously, you know, male, female. But you know what I mean? It's like whoever is perfect for you. Because maybe you have a quirky sense of humor. You know, maybe you like to travel. Maybe you don't. You know, some people don't like to travel internationally. So they wouldn't be compatible with a person who loves to go abroad every other year. But don't you find once you, I'm not to get so deadly serious so soon, but, 
don't, don't you find that you get into a relationship and you find that that there is no you know Mr. Right that that there are things that you're not getting that or maybe that person can't supply every, you know everything you need or maybe you don't have all the interests that you thought you had. Um, I think if you find that and if you're unhappy, then you should end the relationship and move on. Because I had a relationship for three months. I thought the guy was fantastic, and he was. I mean, he had a lot of good qualities. But as we were dating, things popped up that I didn't like. Things that, you know, long term, I was like, I really don't see myself with this guy long term. And in the beginning, there were good things. And then as it unfolded, I realized this is not the one for me. So I have a, a dating rule of three where you do a short 30 minute meet and greet in the beginning to see if you have chemistry you do three dates if you don't like the person after three dates move on then the three month rule if you've been dating for three months and you have any doubt at all in your mind that this is not the person to go the distance break up with them move on find someone else well that's that's pretty typical isn't it that three month average isn't it that's about uh, how long it takes to really get to know somebody and and then to discover the things about them that you really can't stand yeah I mean I well before the old me uh, before my books and everything I would have uh, stuck with it because I'm a really loyal person and the old me would have stuck with this guy because he was such a nice guy and he was he was a super nice guy but he wasn't the right guy for me but in my head I kept saying he's a nice guy he's a nice guy you know and before I just would have stuck loyal to the relationship and I think that's where people fail is when they're loyal to the relationship just because they want to see the relationship move forward and they don't want to give up but isn't that a common, you know, not to pick on your gender, but isn't that a common <laughs> female mistake? Aren't aren't most women, they get involved with the relationship and, and then they, they can't get out of it and they can't do anything about it except, you know, complain about it. Yeah, and I think, and that's the thing is that um, there's this thing that's kind of like, uh, called circular dating, uh, which I write about in my second book, is where usually men, you know, they'll date multiple women until they find the one where women we go on one date and we're like oh that's the one and we discontinue all communication with any other guys and we just concentrate on that one guy well really when you're dating you're dating so and, what you're saying is why can't a woman be more like a man yeah we should date more like men you know we shouldn't just all of a sudden zone in on one person you know we need to have fun and I, and I mean dating I don't mean sexual relations because that's not healthy you know I'm just talking about in the beginning stages of dating going out on dates and remember I took that poll um, I was doing Facebook polls uh, for my second book and I put that as a poll and I published them in this book so um, it was interesting to see. I think you actually answered on this poll. I tried. I might have. I tried. <laughs> yeah, I do. I have you on a few of these. Since if it, if it comes to dating and sex, we probably disagree on just about everything. I'm sure I tried to weigh in with my opposing <laughs> opinion. You think that you and I disagree? Uh, yeah, I think so. Really? Why? Yeah, well, cause Why? Because we, we come from other sides of, of the age and gender gap. Yeah, but I don't really think that. I mean, I'm just trying to do things in a healthy way, you know, and I think it doesn't really matter what age or gender or anything like that. You know, if you're coming from a healthy place, then it's, it's pretty much all on the same page. Well, I'm not sure there is a, a Mr. or Mrs. Right. For, uh, for, for one thing, I, I think this one of the single most important criteria in, in a successful relationship is the other person is one, the other person wants to have a relationship with you. Mm -hmm. and, and relationships aren't easy. I think that they take some effort. Well, they take a and, lot of effort. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't like to think that they should be work, but it should be somebody that you're so interested in. And for guys, initially, you know, maybe it's physical beauty and charm, but you're initially so interested in them that they are worth the effort. She is mm -hmm. worth getting out of the car, going around, and opening the door for, or or taking her out, or waiting, like you said, that you know, the three dates. Mm -hmm. um, it, she is worth getting to know, you know, better. Um, mm -hmm. And and you continue to enjoy with her, to be with her. That's that's still an effort. It's not necessarily work, but it's still an effort. Well, yeah, you have to put forth an effort, you know, because a relationship is just like a plant. If you don't water it, it's going to die. So you just can't expect things just to happen, you know, uh, without like putting some kind of effort into it. But it shouldn't be 
overly difficult when you're spending so much time putting so much effort into it and it just feels like work all the time then that's when you know it's really not going anywhere i'm always hearing about people that that oh and he did this and he did that and they're still in the relationship yeah and and, and i don't mean like necessarily cheating because i i could actually see how people might forgive something like that if it was a one-time thing or uh, you know but they, they'll be they'll be sometimes wonderful charming guys that have horrible horrible habits or or proclivities and the women are just like oh well you know he loves me and they're like no <laughs> you know you can do better than that and, exactly. they, and they still just stick with stick with them and well I think that's because people you know they're scared to be alone they don't want to be alone and so they'll make up excuses of why they should stay in the relationship and when you start making up excuses for other people's behavior um, that's when you got to go you know I mean it's just that's in the rule my three strikes you're out if someone's treating you bad you you know, well, you shouldn't even wait three times the first time you're out. If someone lies, you're out. You know, any kind of behavior where they do it once, okay, maybe it was a fluke. Second time, it's not three times. That's just who they are. That's their personality. Three strikes, you're out. Just get out of the relationship. Well, where and where are people supposed to find this kind of strength? You know, where where Within is it? Within themselves. <laughs> and that's much easier said than done. It is. Especially and it, it's if difficult. you're in a relationship and you don't have that kind of strength. I know. Well, that's why you have to read these books because, you know, like my first book is all about me because um, I've had my friends who have read it who are married, you know, and basically they said that, you know, it's, it's a story about me taking my life back because I've been through hell and high waters and I've survived and I've taken myself from a very negative place um, to a very positive place. And so the first book is about me taking my life back. I just apply it to dating and relationships because really in your entire life, it is relationships. It's about relationships with your father, your mother, your brothers, your sisters, your family, your work, you know, our entire lives, we are in multiple relationships all the time. And it's all how we function in those relationships. And if you're in codependent ones, if you're in negative ones, you're in toxic ones, it's going to affect your life, you know, all, all the way around. True. I'm nodding my head. I'm sure everybody can see. <laughs> yes, on the feed. All right, so those are my books. So let's Okay, go. so I can't argue with that, so let's pick something else. <laughs> something else you want to argue about? Okay, um, so now, unfortunately, um, I haven't had a chance to read all these books. I really wanted to, but I've just been so busy with everything. Um, but I did uh, do a little bit of search on them. And the first one here is Crazy Time. Surviving Divorce and Building a New Life. Oh, that's great. You pick you pick the one book that I only have like one line of notes on. <laughs> um, I, I read this book. I did read it from cover to cover. Um, I was surprised to find that so little of, uh, about it on, online. I, I mm -hmm. can't tell you how many copies it sold or anything like that. And the strange thing is, though, when I mentioned it to people, many people recognize the name. And what, and what, uh, what was good for the, me about this book was at the time of the, my divorce, I was going through this crazy time. And mm -hmm. as I read each part of the book, it related to the stages that I was going through. So I'd read a chapter and I'd you know, stop and think about it. And then I'd read, you know, another chapter and then I'd stop and think about it. And it really helped me go through those particular stages. Okay. That sounds great. Well, it looks like we have a caller on the line. Um, so we're going to go home and patch him in. Hello. Welcome to the Dating Jungle. Who are we speaking with? Hi, Tara. It's Nathan. How's it going? Hey, Nathan. How are you? Good. Uh, just want to say congratulations on your first uh, episode of the Dating Jungle. Thank you. <laughs> the Nathan is uh, very familiar with my other show, uh, The Dating Jungle, that I have on Tuesday nights with my male co-hosts, um, Ben Charles and Sabatino, and he's called in a couple times to that show. Oh, okay. So he's a fan or a friend? He Well, he is, he's a fan, and he is also in my second book. Um, he's one of my case studies that I interviewed um, uh, for 10 Rules to Survive the Internet Dating I, uh, Jungle, I interviewed four men, and uh, Nathan was one of them. And then okay. he's also a client. I've done coaching sessions with Nathan. Oh, good. And he was the first experimental client that I did a wing woman and hitch sessions with. 
Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Colin does If you read the article, you'll see how it went. <laughs> I think it went well. You know, it's kind of, have you seen the movie Hitch, Colin? Yeah. Okay, yeah. it's kind of like that. Yeah. I'm basically helping Nathan, uh, you know, redefine and sharpen his dating skills out in the physical jungle. Like, we're in the meat of it with the people at the bars, socializing, and I'm there with him, and I'm helping him, like, every single his step wing of the woman. way. I am his wing woman. <laughs> Yeah, okay. <laughs> so um, I I've heard of that strategy. It, it might uh, be in this, this first show, book. Because my internet, um, mm -hmm. you know, it kind of started the show late. Um, but uh, I was listening into the first part where you were talking about uh, staying in relationships or getting out of them when you know something's going on. And um, I just wanted to share the experience uh, that I had. Um, I was just in a relationship and just looking back, um, even though it didn't go anywhere, uh, one thing I took out of it was I know I have a better idea of what I want in a relationship than when I went into it. And the one thing I don't want is somebody who is unavailable, like we're only meeting like once every two weeks at the most because mm -hmm. when that happens it's like kind of uh, the connection dampens um to say the least well that, yeah. that's not really like a boyfriend and girlfriend relationship uh, you know that's more like you're just dating Mm -hmm. Right. She's using you to take her out. I, I've been there. I've done that. <laughs> and and that can happen, you know, and that's what I was, you know, kind of coaching Nathan along with this relationship that, you know, you cannot assume exclusive. Uh, exclusivity you have to assume in the beginning that everybody is dating other people and so you have the conversation that only if she's good looking <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know that you're only dating each other so you know the fact that they only hung out like maybe once a week or whatever I was like well you're not even ready for that conversation and you know the whole thing about relationships is that they should be stepping stones on a learning process and so you know every relationship is there for a purpose and Nathan just like you said now you know a little bit more about what you do want and what you don't want and so then you can take that to the next relationship and you know you just kind of move on stepping stones into a positive you know more idea of what you do want so then eventually when the right girl comes along that then you know and not everybody, you know, not everybody wants that. And and they may say, yeah, I want a boyfriend and girlfriend, but they don't want that intimate bonding relationship that that, uh, that you may be looking for, that a lot of people are looking for. To them, dating means, you know, hey, we go out Friday night and, you know, that's it. And exactly. Other, you know, and other people, myself included, we think dating is a process towards something else. You know, I don't know what, living, like living together, I guess, or, you know, some sort of, you know, more intimate relationship. Mm-hmm. And that's why you have to have the conversations. You know, it's like, unfortunately, it's difficult to have these conversations. And that's where people, I think, lack is that they don't communicate. And I now, I mean, as soon as I start dating someone within three to four dates, I just say, hey, look, this is my life plan. I want to get married. I want to have kids. Are you on the same life plan? Because if you don't, then I'm not going to date you because I know where I want to be in the future. It doesn't mean I want it today. It doesn't mean I want it tomorrow. Right. But I want to know that that's an option in the future. And it's not putting pressure on anyone. It's just being open and communicating where your life wants to go. And if that person is like, well, I, I'm not the marriage kind of guy or girl, then okay, thank you. Have a nice day. We'll move on. <laughs> and I, I did speak to a psychologist about that. Uh, um, for uh, a meetup group that, that I'm in, that there are a lot of singles, the Tampa Bay Adventurers. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did have a psychologist a couple years ago come and talk to us, and she said that's perfectly okay. In fact, people who are out on the first couple dates, they will talk about what are the goals, what are you looking for, what do you want in a relationship. And people who want you know a serious, intimate relationship, maybe you know sleeping together, living together, uh, possibly moving in together, maybe even marriage, people still use that word, I think. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in some states, you know, it's it's okay. Yeah. Um, but that's that's okay to have. Actually, some people have that on the first date. Yeah. Uh, you can have that the first couple days. There's nothing wrong with it as long as you can do it and put it out there and not have it be too serious. Not like, you know, you don't want to be like, like for women, I want to get married now because the clock's ticking. Like not that kind of pressure, just an open, you know, conversation. So that's something definitely, Nathan, you know, I think you should work on when you find someone that's worth the conversation. Because I'm sure with the last girl, you guys probably didn't talk about that, did you? Right. 
not at all. I never brought it up. I just uh, went through the flow, and she did too. And it just, uh, you know, kind of just phased out. Because um, from what I'm feeling, because I know she just got out of a long-term relationship. She was like in a long-term relationship for four years prior. And so I feel like she was uh, in that period where she was feeling lonely and she probably needed uh, somebody to fill the void. I'm just speculating here. I don't, I don't really know if that's really the case, but it seems like that's what happened. Well, it, you know what? Actually, my, from my point of view, it, it doesn't actually matter. And I'm not the dating coach. I'm just the, I'm just the writer. Um, but all that really matters is what you felt about it and how you thought about it. I mean, I don't know if you're still friends with her, but she's not, you know, a candidate anymore. So it doesn't actually matter, in my opinion, what what she felt or what she thought. I mean, it's too late now to bring this subject up with her. It's more oh, yeah. uh, what you feel. Like, this is not the one. Okay, next, you know, go on to the others. Mm -hmm. you as know, long line as something you can. up for this weekend. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Seriously. Yeah, no, I know. I mean, it's just like kind of move on. I mean, you shouldn't get be that much invested. You know, when you've only been dating someone for like a month or two, I mean, you should not be completely invested. Your heart emotionally, because if you are, then um, you probably suffer from love, love addict syndrome. <laughs> Which is unhealthy as well. So, but um, go ahead. And I think a big part of it too, and this is like not a good thing for if anybody else is listening and if they have the same problem, it's not a good thing to get into. But there's that whole ego thing and then the whole like reputation you have because it's like, oh, I see other people, they're having these long lasting relationships and they're having the time of their lives and it's like, I should be having that. And when, it, when I'm not having it, it's like I have the feeling that something is wrong. And we had an interesting discussion this past Monday at Landmark about making it and uh, feeling that something's wrong when really things are just what they are and they're that exactly. way because um, they're supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And so it shouldn't be all about trying to make it because you're never going to make it when you do make it. Like, say, if uh, I was to get into... Um, this uh, long-term relationship that I, um, you know, look up to for other people for having, then that's not going to necessarily fulfill my life. There's always going to be other issues out there. Well, yeah. And so I, um, you know, you just take it uh, life uh, for it is. You know, you just create the possibility for yourself to be at peace. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is that you can't compare yourself to someone else. Like I can't compare my relationship to Colin's relationship and I can't compare, you know, someone who's been married for 10 years to my life because, you know, each person is going through their own individual journey in this world when things happen for a reason. And, you know, if I make myself feel bad because I'm from Nebraska, all my girlfriends got married at 20, had kids, you know, some of them have like three, four kids now, some are divorced and remarried. And at 32, I was still single, never been married. And so then I forced myself down the marriage path to the wrong guy for the wrong reasons. And, you know, cause I was comparing myself to everyone else. Well, I was on a different life path. You know, their life path led them to marriage early and mine didn't. Mine led me to Florida. <laughs> so mm. you can never compare yourself to other people because, you know, it's it's difficult because I know we do and we're jealous or, you know, of what other people have. But you just have to only look at yourself and measure your successes and, you know, where you've started, where you've ended, what you're doing to improve yourself and only measure yourself within your own successes and never compare it to anyone else. Well, it, uh, I love, I love, uh, I love Landmark. I think their sessions are, are wonderful. I think they're very good value. And I, I think they're absolutely right there. There is, you know, what, what, what happened and then what you take it to mean. And, you know, even if you're from Nebraska, that that's what <laughs> happened. Uh, but that's not what it means. If you're still single, that doesn't mean that there's somehow something wrong with you. Exactly. Um, right. What I would say to you, Nathan, and is, uh, you know, you should check out some of the books that we're talking about uh, here. One of them, which is the the game by Neil Strauss. I don't know if you heard oh, of yeah, Neil Strauss. I, uh, I actually had another friend say, "Oh yeah, you should read this book." 
You um, you should uh, it, you should it's it's and don't and don't let any women read it or tell you about it. Um, it but it's very empowering okay. for it's very empowering for men in particular because you know it is a hunt and we are on the hunt and it and it it gives you some skills as a hunter and the 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 advice in there does work. Um, I make it a habit to talk to the most beautiful women in the room whenever I'm in any room. And believe me, going to meetings are a lot more fun, uh, you know, because of it. And I, and I still do it even though I'm in a relationship. But it really helps you talk to women, particularly women that you think are somehow uh, too beautiful or too good looking or above you. And it gives you some of those skills to, to approach them. And if it doesn't work, go on to the next. Uh, and gives you some of the confidence. Plus, it's a fun book. Um, he's also the guy that wrote Jenna Jameson's autobiography, so the guy knows how to do some wild <laughs> and crazy writing. Interesting. Yeah, I kind of I had to look that up. I uh, read some <clears throat> of the stuff online about it. Um, but I think kind of what he's going at is saying that, you know, when you go up and approach like a beautiful woman, you know, and, and I've been telling this to Nathan is that like, you know, men, I think they have a problem talking to women is they put women on a pedestal right? and they think that, oh my God, they're like a goddess or they're like a famous person, you know, and I've been doing this myself um, as I've been networking with some really, you know, big people in uh, the industry out here in Tampa because th- we have so many wonderful entrepreneurs in Tampa. It's, you meet so many cool people. And you're, you know, like you're so nervous to go and talk to these people because they're famous and, you know, they're leaders in their industry. But you just have to think about it. They're just people. They wake up in the morning and they put on their pants one leg at a time. So do women, unless we put on a skirt. Then that's like two legs at once. But, you know, you just have to look at any good looking guy, any good looking girl, any famous person, anyone that you want to talk to and just be like, hey, they're normal, just like you and me. There's, there's really no difference, you know, at all. And just put it back on that human level. Well, the game will go uh, beyond that. He actually kind of gives guys, you know, the the skills to take a few hits and take a few whacks. He he calls it the neg, and uh, it's not oh, necessarily yeah, it, oh. it, it's not necessarily uh, very positive when you think of it that way. I don't like but, that term. But the way I like to think of it, of course not. That's why I said don't mention this book to anyone. <laughs> but you know, the the way I like to think of it, Nathan, is is you you have to no matter how beautiful she is, no matter how much you think she's you know above you, you if if you just want to talk to her at all if you want to be comfortable talking to beautiful women you still have to engage them as a person you still have to engage them as an intellectual you still have to engage them in a conversational level and and forget the fact that she's gorgeous she doesn't want to hear that she hears that all the time and forget the fact that you're drooling all over her you know you have to wipe up the drool you have to man up and you have to go up and and talk to her because guess what you know as gorgeous as she is she's still just a woman and she still wants to be engaged on an intellectual level Exactly. And sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes it's very hard, you know, to, to go on a date with, with a woman like that. And she's so gorgeous. All you want to do is jump on her. And and instead, <laughs> you have to do be. Don't do that. Don't right, jump don't on do someone like a, like a dog. Uh, don't that do that. That's the worst thing. <laughs> right. Instead, you got to be cool. And the game the game will kind of give you, you know, some of the confidence in a, in a, in a kind of a fun, entertaining way of, of how to do this and how to be comfortable doing it. So, so the point, the. So you get to the point where you go into the room and first thing you do is, is check out, as you do, I know you do, go ahead, you can say it, it nobody's listening. Um, you go into the room and you check out who's the best looking woman and, and you know, in the old days, you know, maybe you didn't go up to the best looking woman, but from now on, you absolutely should because uh, beautiful women are, are uh, they're beautiful, they're fun, <laughs> they're fun to talk to, uh, even if you're not going out on a date. Yeah, Nathan, you should read that book, and then the next time we do a wing woman session, you can like practice some of there the you go. some of the skills. Take your wing woman just for the fun of it. <laughs> just for. Well, thanks for calling in, Nathan. We're gonna discuss some more of these books and uh, and move on because we have we have a few more to get to. But really appreciate you calling in on the first episode of my second talk show, and we will. I'm sure we'll hear from you soon again. All right. Well, take care, Tara. All uh, right. We'll you too. We'll talk to you later, and um, take care. Thanks, right. Nathan. Bye-bye. Bye. All right. So the next book here, Men Are From Mars and Women Are From Venus. And I know this book has been around forever. And I think I even bought it once, and I started reading it, and then 
I stopped. It's, it's hard for me as an author to read books because I don't want to take from someone else's writing and subconsciously put it into my own. So I've been writing so much I haven't had time to, to read others. But I know that um, that this is a good book and many, many people. How many has it said it sold? It, it sold 50 million copies, which wow. I think is one of the reasons why everybody thinks – They've heard of it, even if they haven't. And I have to tell you, his videos are a lot of fun. I mean, you oh, don't really? have to read the book. You can go, you know, get some of his videos, and they're mm -hmm. a lot of fun. But it really talks uh, about how men and women have two different languages. And the example I always like to uh, give is a woman says, let's go to a movie. And what she means is, let's spend some quality time together. And the guy says, let's go to the movie. And what he means is, there's a big action flick, and I don't want to <laughs> miss it. You know, it's not the same thing. Yeah. And it, the words are the same, but the meaning is very very different and he goes on and on and on with lots of examples like that mm -hmm. uh, I think one thing that has entered the vernacular is that he talks about how men are problem solvers women will say oh this is happening at work this is happening at work and really they just want to vent they want to mm -hmm. let it out and I personally understand that I'm a venter I want to let it out <laughs> I you <am> know too. <laughs> and, and I dump on my family and friends and it, it is something I'm I, I intentionally trying to work on and, and of uh -huh. course I'm still working on it I'm not succeeding but but women are different and they'll they'll expect explain how things are going wrong at work and a man is like well just do this or just quit that job or just tell her off and just and that's mm -hmm. not necessarily what it is about we're not women aren't always looking for the problem to be solved but the men are looking to solve the problem yeah uh, because our language is very different so it's a fun it's a fun book books and videos yeah I definitely I definitely agree with that you know I mean we are we do you know communicate in completely different ways and I've actually been trying to change my communication patterns um, with men because I know most men are like short they're to the point they don't want all the details they don't want the long drawn-out story it's just like okay you want to go out on Friday night all right where do you want to go what time do you want me to pick you up you know just short sweet to the point and I've been I've been starting to do that instead of like you know right. women we kind of suggest things well why don't we maybe do this or how you know like I, and I've noticed this I can't remember where I was reading it but then like when I was writing emails I, you know women are like how you know could you possibly maybe do this sometime whenever you have time to get this done guys are like I need this upload it now Five minutes, you know, is just right. straight into the point. Right. So I've been trying. And if women are like that towards men, you know, we tend to think they're being rude. So it's it's strange how it, how it's different. Yeah, and you know, I've been, I've been changing myself of instead of like I'll write an email and have that. However, when you have time, and then I go back and I just cut it out. And I'm like, I need this. I need it by five. I need it this size. And you know, just straight into the point. Don't like dilly dally around right. it. You know. The other thing, Dr. John Gray says, and and you can absolutely do this. I've done it myself, and it absolutely works. You can always ask a woman. Woman at any time, how do you feel about it? How do you feel about this? Oh, I'm thinking of Ty Thursday night. How do you feel about this? Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm thinking about the next book should be even smaller or even bigger. <laughs> you know, and and uh, the, you know her books get larger, larger. I in know size. they keep getting bigger. How do you feel and bigger. about that? Isn't that you know? funny? Like this one's How is so it? little. Right. How do you feel and about that? That one's so big. I think honestly, this and I'll tell you flat out, it was an ego thing. You know, when I wrote the first book and I got it, and I'm like, wow, that's so small. So I set out to make a huge book, and I did. I mean. It's like yeah. it's so much bigger. Yeah. But then the problem I got to when I put it on Kindle, it's way too big for Kindle. So what I did is I have the second it, one is too big for Kindle. Well, I mean, I have it all on there, but it's just it's enormous. It's just wow. Kindle. Like smaller books are better for Kindle. So what I did is I uploaded it because they're both available on Amazon for Kindle. If you search Sarah Richter or Surviving the Dating Jungle, you can download it for nine ninety nine. And or you can download the chapters or the rules because it's ten rules and so little snippets. So you can do each chapter for like three ninety nine. Oh, or you can download okay. the whole book. And so I think um, actually going forward, I'm going to start writing little kind of handbooks of little guides just for the Kindle and, you know, not do the traditional publishing route. I have two. That's good. But now actually my Kindle sales are higher than my uh, paperback sales. So do little short snippets of information because everyone's attention span is too. Nobody can sit down and read like a 200 page book. Nobody well, that's why I mentioned that. Dr. John Gray's <laughs> the videos are fun. The, yeah. you know, the videos are fun with the, you know, the husband Definitely. and wife, you know, talking in their, their or, or any couple talking and they're meaning absolutely different things. Like, mm -hmm. you know, do you want to go to the movies means, you know, something in, entirely different. Yeah. Or you can always ask a woman, how do you feel about that? Or how do you feel about that? Yeah. If, if she's in touch with her feelings, some women aren't, you know, in touch with their feelings. 
and they don't even really know how they feel. They have no idea. Actually, that's what Dr. John Gray e- explains. And, and he's not a medical doctor, which, uh, by the way, I, I, you know, I think is an important distinction. He's got he's... relatively uh, dubious background, as many of these uh, authors do, it, it turns out. Um, but he's not a medical doctor, but he does talk about how you can uh, you know, ask women about their feelings, and they will discover their feelings as they're talking about them. Mm-hmm. The example he gives is, um, you know, the woman says, honey, do you love me? And the guy's like, you know, of course I do. I told you that last year. (laughs) Last year I told you I loved you on Christmas. (laughs) Right. That's right. You know what? You need to hear it again, you know? (laughs) See, and that's the thing. Like, I think women, we like to hear things, but a a lot more of it, it's it's the little things. It's the actions, not words, you know. I try to pay attention to, like, the little things that people do that kind of show how they love you um, by just, you know, I can't even think of an example right now at the hop, on the top of my head. So it's not always saying it, but, you know, it's like the little things that you do. Yeah, like, but now you're jumping ahead. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Am yeah. I getting to? <laughs> no, you're jumping, no, you're jumping ahead. No, there's no particular sequence in that. But it's funny that you mentioned that because oh, is one, that of the, other one? one of the books I love, which you've probably also heard, is The Five Love Languages. Yes. And this is great. There is a website. You can just Google the website, The Five Love Languages. There's a simple little test. Who knows how accurate it really is? Oh, I should but have taken that. You, everybody should take it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, Nathan, are you still there? You should oh, take no, it too. Wait. Because oh, yeah, if, he's listening. Uh, if you're still listening. Um, but Because it's actually a very handy tool when you're out on a date or when you're getting to know somebody, and, or even if you're in a relationship, to find out how do they expect to communicate with the persons, the people that they love in their life. And it could be, you know, it could be a friend, it could be a girlfriend, it could be their family, but we all have these love languages that are important to us. And the five Five love languages are words of affirmation, gifts. The words of affirmation is is what Tara was just talking about. I think that she jumped ahead on. Uh, (laughs) Sometimes it's just plain gifts. Sometimes it's act of service. Sometimes it's quality touch. Uh, quality time or physical touch and what that really means is if if you're in a relationship with somebody and they're feeling good do you do you want to share their feeling good by hugging them and kissing them uh, which is what you know what I do or do you want them to share that they're feeling good with gifts or do you want them to share that they're feeling good with acts of service and it works the other way around it could be if you're feeling good or bad, or if they're feeling good or bad, you're going to find that people have this modality for communication in which they expect that type of response. Mm-hmm. Uh, and just to use myself as a, uh, a guinea pig, a, a gray hair guinea pig, <laughs> um, I took the test a couple times now, and okay. I always rank for quality time and physical touch. I always those always come up the highest. If I'm in a relationship, family, friends, uh, I expect people to come and, and spend some time with me one on one. Phone call is good uh, definitely you know people who are in relationships call each other regularly yeah uh, unless you know you're dating nathan's uh, girlfriend there <laughs> um but i don't think they're a boyfriend girlfriend <laughs> but i still expect quality time sooner or yeah. later i expect you to sit down spend five minutes with me have a cup of coffee spend some time getting to know each other again one-on-one and communicating one-on-one that's mm-hmm. my love language you're feeling bad i'm going to want to spend quality time with you mm-hmm. you're feeling good i'm going to want to spend quality time with you and and vice versa. Mm-hmm. And the same is true for physical touch. If I'm feeling bad, I want to hug. If I'm feeling good, I want to hug somebody. Mm-hmm. You know, it's the same thing. That's my love language. So if you're doing little acts of service for me, that's not going to work. You're mm-hmm. not communicating that you love me. If you're giving me little tokens, oh, here, honey, I got this for you. I'm like, okay, that's nice. I certainly appreciate it. Everybody appreciates gifts, yeah. but that's still not my love language. That's not what I need when I'm feeling bad. And that's not how I'm going to try and communicate with you when I'm feeling good. Mm-hmm. So uh, out mm-hmm. on a date, it's nice to kind of play this game. And and I have played this game. And so I do... how do you find out when you're on a date and you don't know someone, do you say, take this test? Or do you just observe the way that they are acting to try to find out their love language? Well, I, I, I will... I will, when you're in the dating stage and you know you're thinking about a relationship and you're talking about relationships, that's when you bring it up. And you're like, mm-hmm. hey, did you take this test? Let's go online and take this test. Yeah. You know, and, and here, answer these questions. Do you prefer words of affirmation or gifts of service? Do you prefer quality time or physical touch? Mm-hmm. And they keeps going down that list. And you can find out the, the, the person you're with, and I have a friend, her, her love language is definitely words of affirmation. She wants to hear from her boyfriend <laughs> how good she is. Mm -hmm. She wants to hear 
that she's appreciated. She wants to hear that she's beautiful. She, those are, you know, that she's talented. Mm -hmm. And even though he said those things last year at Christmas, <laughs> <laughs> even though he said those things, she still wants to hear it. That's yeah. her, that's her love language. So I, it's I a very powerful tool for getting along, with, you know, with people. It is, you know, it's funny because I was listening when you and Cece were talking about this a um, couple months ago, it must have been, because that's when I was with the last guy that I was dating. And while we were listening to you guys talk about this, he, he was married before, too, and divorced. And when they were having issues, they read this book and they both took the test. His was physical touch. His ex-wife was all of them. And he's wow, like, that's unusual. All of them. And he's like, so how am I supposed to do everything for her? She didn't have one clear love language. No, it was all of them. So she wanted the affirmation. She wanted the gifts. She wants acts of service. She wanted the quality time. She wanted the physical touch. I mean, that's a lot. That's a high maintenance. Or, or either so, that or she didn't really know when she took the test. Because be. when you take the test, it's kind of asking you to choose one or the other. And if you're not clearly choosing one or the other and you're yeah. balanced over all of them. Maybe you're you just know, confused. Maybe you're confused. Or maybe know. it really is all of them and he has to switch modalities from time to time. And go back you know? and forth. Like, yeah. here, honey, I got this for you. Or here, honey, I did this for you. Or, you, mm -hmm. know, you know, that kind of thing. I can definitely, I know uh, just from my ex-husband, and he was the physical touch kind of guy and I'm just I'm not you know I mean I'll be more like touchy-feely with someone when I'm in a relationship with them but to me you know like you 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 need to have the touch the hug or whatever I grew up my parents like never hugged me we were cold German Swedish people and we don't hug we don't okay that's you know. northern Germany uh, yeah. by the way not southern Germany oh, okay. southern well, Germany I'm... they they actually believe that they've been contaminated by the Italians and that they're way too touchy and feely the northern <laughs> it's true really? it must be true I heard it on NPR. I don't know, but it's on um, both sides of my family. My dad's side is German. My mom's side is Swedish. We've just never been huggy, touchy, feely, lovey, dummy, like at all. And so I just grew up like when my girlfriends would hug me, I felt weird. I'm like, what? what why are you giving me a hug? Like, right. I mean, I right. I had to get into that and actually, you know, it and and learn how to hug and and be you know affectionate towards people. It was really hard for me growing up in a family that just wasn't that way. It's just it's mm -hmm. really it's really strange. Uh, my cousin, she's majoring in psychology, and she did a whole report on it. And she told me last time at Christmas, and I was like, that is so interesting because I'm having the same problems, you know, because of our heritage and just the way that it was and not expressing your feelings because like in in Switzerland or whatever, I guess it's like cold and rainy all the time. So you're not supposed to express your feelings outwardly. You're always supposed to be happy. And my family, they're just very happy. And they never want to discuss anything that's real. Like when I was going through my divorce, and if you read my first book, how devastating it was, because it wasn't just, you know, a typical divorce. It was all kinds of drama. And my mom wouldn't tell anyone. And I don't care. I'm the kind of person, I'll tell everybody anything. My right. whole life is an open book. Right. It's all right here. You know, you do is read it and you find out about oh, me. It's two open books. It is. It's two <laughs> open books, you know. And they're, and, and they're what, nine ninety nine. you can get your whole life? Uh, on uh, for, uh, for Kindle. Yeah, for Kindle. If you buy them autographed, they're $20, like, you know. For the printed copies, but yeah, nine ninety nine on Kindle for twenty bucks. There's my whole life that, right there. There's your whole life so it far. Is, so, so hopefully, far. there's going to be several more coming. Oh yeah, there's going to yeah. be definitely. There's a whole dating jungle series. It's going to kind of be like chicken soup for the soul. And, and what about the Fifty Shades of Terra? Is that is that coming? Uh no, you know I don't like that book personally. I'm no? just going to put it out there. We had this discussion with a good friend of mine. You know Angie Fox, right? Yeah. So I was at her house on Monday night, and um, she had some friends come over, and we were discussing the Fifty Shades of Grey, and um. I don't like the book. I haven't read it, but I know everything about it because all my girlfriends have read it. Okay, basically Fifty Shades of Grey is for all the housewives that are stuck at home that aren't fully living their lives to where they really want to be. So they have to live vicariously through these fantasies of someone else. See, Angie and I, we're living our lives the fullest. You know, we're doing it. We're out there. We're Whatever we want to do, we're doing it. We're to live in a fantasy, and that's what we call our lives. These, I mean, sorry, you know, for everyone that loves Fifty Shades of Grey, but it's just they're not living their life to the fullest capacity because if you were, you wouldn't have to have a fantasy through that. Just do it. You know, make your life exciting, make it fun. You know, if you're married, you know, have a rendezvous with your husband, like whatever, just spice it up, make it sizzle. Don't have to read these books and get so lost in fantasy land, especially like the Twilight Saga, which I never read any of those either. And I have friends that will read them over and over and over again. And I'm I, like, I can't believe that.
Fifty Shades of Grey is a lot like the Twilight Saga. Yeah. I mean, it's fun, easy, you know, beach porn. <laughs> Did you say beach porn? Yeah. <laughs> That's hilarious. Well, it's like one of those books you take to the beach, you know. You're, you're just relaxing. You're kind of indulging yourself. Yeah. Both of them are. Twilight and Fifty Shades of Grey. I just Grey. say for people that are addicted to those, just go out and make your life the Fifty Shades of Grey. Go out and make it the Twilight Saga. You know, live your life so that it's so exciting. You don't have to, like, Tie somebody know, down, bite them on the neck. Well, your husband, yeah, why not? You know, tomorrow night, tie him down, bite him on the neck, see what happens. I mean, geez, you gotta, you gotta keep it spicy. You know, you gotta keep it sizzling in, in the marriage, because that's when things go sour. I think is when you're stuck in the mundane and people get bored and you're in your normal, you know, daily routines and you got the kids and you got, yeah. you know, every now and then you gotta like plan it. You know, like once a month, every couple of months or whatever, just plan a fun night. Get a babysitter, have the kids go spend the night somewhere at a friend's house and I don't know, get some whips and chains and whatever, just go crazy. Well, it doesn't even have to be that wild. I, I was married 14 years and, and, you know, guys are like, oh, what's it like being with the, you know, the same woman for 14 years? And it's surprising that it can be exciting. Mm -hmm. But it could be little things like, you know, she calls you from the grocery store and she says, you know, I'm, I'm standing in front of the whipped cream section. You know, should I, <laughs> should I get some whipped cream? You know, and, and you may not see that whipped cream for, well, till Friday or Saturday night, but you still, you know, it's there. Yeah, exactly. It's little fun stuff. You know, like I just did a blog today called uh, How to Keep the Sizzle in Your Relationship. And um, you can do it by making little traditions that are just for you and your, you know, significant other, something that's fun. Like um, I have this thing I like to call uh, Motivational Hump Day Wednesday Picks where I send sexy pics on hump day, every hump day, so that it's consistent and it makes him I look I just like the idea of a hump day. <laughs> Well, that too, but it, it makes them look forward to Wednesday. It's like middle of the week, you know, you're in the office, you're in these dry, you know, statistic meetings, and then you come out and you have this nice hot little photo, you know, from the person you're in a relationship with, and it just, you know, it's just something fun, like little things that you can, you know, create like with your significant other to make it special that, you know, you're not doing with anybody else. So definitely got to keep the relationship sizzle up. No, that that uh, that definitely sounds good, and in, and in fact, um, w one of the books, uh, one of the last books that I wanted to talk about is getting the love that you want, and and you, you, these these all kind of work together, and I think that's why that's why I think they're so enduring, and I find myself you know recommending them over and over again, and 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 talking about them over and over again when I have the uh, chance to, mm -hmm. and the the last book is getting the love that you want um, by uh, Harville Hendricks, and uh, again he's not a um, a medical doctor, but this has been a big seller for um, for decades now, actually. And mm -hmm. he's he's got a therapy practice uh, um, that's based around it. One of the things he talks about is the difference between bonders and isolators. And Nathan, I'm going to pick on you again. Um, <laughs> because that girl that just wanted to go out a few times, um, that may have been her idea of a relationship, but that doesn't sound to me like she was a bonder. And there's a difference between people who want to bond and people who want to isolate mm -hmm. and, and how they react to childhood traumas. And the, the example that they give is something bad happens to you as a child. As a child, you learn to react to it in one of two ways, typically. And one is you isolate. You run and hide, you know, in the closet or under the bed, and you isolate until you feel better. And the uh -huh. other way is bonding. And bonding is you run to mummy and hang on to her skirts until you feel better. Mummy gives you a hug. And is we've that all codependent, learned codependent, or is that? Well, um, only if you can't ever get off of mommy's okay. skirt, you know, then, then that's codependent, you know. If you're a grown man, Nathan, and you can't get off of mommy's, oh, mommy's yeah. skirt, then, you know, you might be codependent. No, but, I don't think so. But, but we all learn to communicate in relationships this way. And I think actually the relationships that work are between bonders and, and bonders. And you can go out on a date and you can ask somebody, you know, questions about like what your love languages are. But you can also ask, are you a bonder or an isolator? When mm -hmm. something happens to you, would you prefer a I just leave you alone well mm -hmm. that person's probably an isolator they want to go home they're mm -hmm. going to go back to their place they're not coming over to your place yeah they don't want you to help with the problem and i think a lot of successful relationships are between a bonder and a bonder uh, there's 
many successful relationships between a bonder and an isolator. Uh -huh. um, and I find myself in those over and over again. <laughs> and he talks about that too a little bit, how you're looking for the relationship you didn't get as a child. Oh, well, you know? yeah. Everyone does that, I think, in the initial stages. You're looking for that, you know, lost relationship, you know, the father, daughter, the, the son, the mother, you know, and you're seeking out that relationship to fill the voids that you didn't get. Um, and uh, you subconsciously keep finding the same person and playing out those relationships. And you have to get yourself to a conscious level of recognizing that you're doing that, which, you know, it took me going through two failed engagements, one failed marriage to realize I was kept, you know, chasing after this same guy with a different face. And, you know, it wasn't until the, the horrific uh, outcomings of my marriage uh, that put me into the worst heartbreak I've ever had in my entire life. I mean, I honestly, at some points thought I was never going to make it through it. I thought, I mean, I wanted to commit suicide. I mean, it was bad. Yeah. But I think when you can get through that point, then, you know, there's just no going back. You've, you know, completely like I took the negative, I turned it into a positive and I've been going that way ever since. But I think it's really important that people take the time to heal their wounds because when they're going through a bad breakup or, you know, they can't find the one, they keep finding the same guy or girl that's controlling, manipulative, you know, toxic relationship. You have to take the time out to heal your wounds, to find out, you know, why do I keep finding these people? Because whatever you put out there in the world, it's going to come back to you. So you're attracting these people for a reason and you're attracted to them for a reason. So until you can heal your wounds and become self-aware, you know, um, that's when you can really find true love. You can find, like I say, Mr. or Mrs. Perfect for you. Um, you can find that, that whole being once you become a whole being within yourself. Oh, well, that kind of brings us right back to the first book, which is at the beginning, The Crazy Time by uh, Abigail Trafford. Mm -hmm. And one of the things she does talk about is you do need time to heal. And when you've had a trauma or a crisis in your life, one of the things that's going to happen is your family and friends are ready to heal long before you are. You know, three months later, you know, they're over it. You know, they're they're ready for it to be over. And you may not be. Six months later, you may not be. Uh, you know, it sometimes take a year, years. You know, yeah. I mean, that's what I recommend. My rule of thumb in my books is take a year off from divorce and definitely don't start dating anyone. Um, you know, while you're going through the divorce proceedings, because it's a lot of drama. There's they don't want to date you either. Well, exactly. No one wants to be pulled into that drama. Uh, you don't want to bring anyone else into that drama. Yeah, um, guys, they nobody wants to hear about it. Exactly. I mean, you need to take the time. You know, get some counseling. Um, you know, meet with me, a dating coach. I mean, even though I'm a dating coach, I still help people. You know, through the process of divorce because I've been there. I've done that. Yeah, people and, you need know, that. Yeah, it's just nice to have someone who's gone there that you can talk to. That's a non-interested third party, independent. Like, yeah, objective, I'm not going to judge you. Arbitrary. I'm not your mom. I'm not right. your dad. I have right. no no motive other than to help you. Right. And that's all I want to do is just help you. And you know, and I do that through my coaching sessions. Um, um, I do them in person and over the phone, or people can contact me for that is on my website, tararichter.com. And of course, you know, my books and everything, we're getting down here to the end of the first, of the first radio show. And, you know, I forgot to even say the studio number, uh, which we don't have time for callers, but for the next session, um, I was going to test out the Twitter um, I put on some promotional stuff. You know, if you're too afraid to call in and you don't want to have your voice um, on the air, I'm doing uh, where you can tweet hashtag dating jungle. And I have my phone here and I keep looking at Twitter feed. So anytime during our shows, every Wednesday night at 830, you can call in and um, at 813-235-0644 or you can tweet pound or not pound well what is it pound hashtag dating jungle <laughs> and you know put your question on twitter and i'll be more than happy to answer it so you don't have to um actually talk about it you know on the air um you can also go on our facebook page and like us on dating jungle on facebook follow us on twitter dating jungle be okay um, my blogs are on tampa datingjungle.wordpress.com. 
And also, you're everywhere, man. I am everywhere. <laughs> I'm on Amazon. I'm on everywhere. Yeah, you and, have to be these days. Yeah, definitely. And I also want to mention that on June 8th, there is an expo at the International Academy of Design of Technology. Um, where all podcasters, webcasters, and internet broadcasters are welcome to come in the Tampa Bay area. Is this a good area. place to bring a date? Uh, you could. I don't know why not. Um, the Dating Jungle will be there. I will have a table. So if anyone wants to meet me in person, ask me questions, I'll have my books. Um, it's June 8th. I think it starts at 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, so, yeah, there will be a bunch of people there. It's at the International Academy of Art and Design. For more info, you can go to pwibexpo.com and hope everyone can make it out because it'd be definitely good to meet people in person. Okay, we're going off the air. Thank we you are. very well, much. Thanks this for, a lot of fun. for coming on the first episode of The Dating Jungle. All right. It was great to have you. <laughs> good job. <laughs> Good job. We covered all five books. We did. All right. We'll see you next Wednesday at 830. Thank you and good night. Thanks. I am someone who is looking for love. Real love. Ridiculous. Inconvenient. Consuming. Can't live without each other love everyone is looking for love yet not everyone can find it join me tara richter certified dating coach and published author on the dating jungle finding love a step-by-step -step guide to removing yourself from toxic situations and maintaining healthy relationships proud part of the live and love radio on the talk network